meet Chad McDougall. What on earth do you call that? Ah, uh, lasagna. Lasagna? Looks more like the grated flakes of a dying horse's anus mixed with sick. <laughs> Cook it again. Yeah. And this time, remember the three Chad McDougall rules of the kitchen. Number one, preparation. Two, shout loudly. And three, brightly coloured trousers. Right, on to the next table. Is that meant to be Berf Bergenon, you triple excuse for a Welsh labia? Look at it. Would you eat that? Well, yeah, it looks OK to me. Eat it, then. Go on, get your fat mutant chops in there. Eat it. Eat it. Eat it. <laughs> Oh, no, uh, that's not good. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, Chad. We did the tests, took the audience numbers, um, we're gonna have to let you go, I'm afraid. But I built this bloody network, Alan. I introduced meanness, loud noises, and horrendously obnoxious behaviour to the masses. You can't cancel the devil's broth cooking show. You killed a man in a bland red wine gravy. <laughs> well, you have a point. Now meet Lactavia. Excuse me, how do you say, could you please show me the way to the bathroom? Is that American? Do you speak an American boy? I speak English. I from 15th century. I need toilet. My bladder is going to go boom. Where are you from? You froggy? Crab? You taking a piss, boy? No, no, no. Please, sir. I traveled far in time. I wake up here. I really need bathroom. Move on, boy. We don't have room for your son. Uh, officer, what's the problem here? This here guy's trying to make a fool out of the police, which is a crime in these here parts. And now, now, see here, if he continues, I have to give him a ticket. Or worse, I take him down to the station and show him pictures of Dizzy Gillespie's scrotum. I, a royal prince, Lactavia Borschatz. I, from 15th century Moldovia. I just need to make pee-pee. Toilets this way. I'll show you. He was a world-renowned but thoroughly despised celebrity chef down on his luck. He was a 15th century Moldovian prince who travelled through time by rubbing together the magic unicorn hooves of Clefric Hebrendel. But sometimes you find friendship when you least expect it, and in the unlikeliest of places, like a Chuck E. Cheese bathroom in Southern Townville, USA. So why here then, lactate old chap? Lactavia. Sure, sure. I follow evil Bachla Victor into the vortex with the stolen golden pig ears of Transylpathia. He plans to exchange them for secret of future plans of Romanian Premier so that he can rule the world using a satellite made out of knives or something. Well, wow, that sounds exhausting. Why don't I whip up some truffles hollandaise? They'll have to journey around the stars in order to save the planet, learn real deep inner truths, and become the best of friends. You have no idea how hard it is to slice on beeves in zero gravity. It's okay, I can have the veal without the seasoning. I have almost caught up with the evil Bachla Victor around Peppy Peppy Nebula of Borodea 6. Cleft Jensen, an Academy Award nominee, Herb Squettum stars Chad and Lactavia in Sugar and Space, an intergalactic friendship. Uh, I don't want to alarm you, but I think that brownie green alien thing is humping our fried chicken. Did the chicken give permission? Well, the chicken is dead and can't speak human languages. And then it's rape. Technically necrophilia. Either way, I think we should have the ham for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Out on May 5th, featuring Sean Bean as the voice of God. And now on Radio Flange Goblet, it's the After Movie Diner, which this week is going to feature no less than four mentions of the word groinal. And you're listening to the After Movie Diner. Ah! 
Okay, hello and welcome to yet another episode of the After Movie Diner. And uh, this week we're back in the Cozy Soup and Burger, the famous Cozy Soup and Burger. Well, because the other place we were going to was full. Yeah, which was Paul's. We don't lack imagination. We no, have no. imagination. We wanted to go to Paul's and St. Mark's Place, but it was packed. So we're back here, which is also packed, but but not, not, not as much. We got, a, we got a table. And we have just seen... The Elijah Wood, John Cusack starring, I guess you could call it a movie, <laughs> uh, Grand Piano. Yeah. Neither of us have any idea. Well, we're, we're kind of looking forward to this particular episode because neither of us have any idea what we think. No. Or what that was. No, <laughs> or what it was watched. we just sat through. Yeah, so no we're idea. Quite interesting in, in talking about it to try and figure it out. Yeah, to try and, to try and unlock the mystery. A yeah. lot, yeah. Grand piano. Clever. Clever. For anyone who's seen the film, all five of you, uh, <laughs> you'll understand that, that joke yeah. based on the twist of the film. Which wasn't really a twist, even. It wasn't really a twist. You went, um, oh. All right. Although, I could think of like a billion other ways to get at the thing. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's the most convoluted way. Like, what about a big axe? Yeah. I mean, what about a big axe? Well, that's why the ending didn't make any sense, because he. Anyway. <laughs> For many reasons. Nothing about the film <laughs> made any sense. No, it didn't. It was okay. We'll, we'll, we'll go we'll into it in a minute. We're, we're gonna, gonna we're gonna, gonna quickly just uh, um, figure out what we want. We've got a blue cheeseburger. I think I've never had blue cheeseburger. Yeah, how no, it's that? good. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah. All right, I'll give that a go. <laughs> I've never had that. It's a it's a famous cozy season burger. So we've, yeah, I'm gonna have. We a, thought we should both get a burger. A bacon Swiss burger deluxe. Where's that? Oh yeah, okay. But if I if I don't get the deluxe, can I pinch some of your fries? Of course. Okay, cool. And I would get a sad of Ram Grave. That right. is what I want. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Okay. Nice. Right, well, lovely. Um, so. Well, yeah, so the movie we went to see this week was Grand Piano. Uh, it stars Elijah Wood, it stars John Cusack, and the basic plot, which you can discover from the trailer, is that a uh, assassin or, or someone with a gun has uh, is making or forcing a stage fright afflicted pianist return to the stage and play the best piano piece he's ever played in his life or him or his wife will die. Right. Excuse me, how are you guys? Good, very good. 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 Yourself? Uh, yeah, could I get the um, blue cheeseburger? The last with the french fries? Uh, no, just plain. Is the burger medium? Uh, yeah, uh, well done. Okay. And a cup of coffee. Okay. And I'll have a bacon Swiss burger, deluxe. Medium? Uh, medium well. Okay. Um, and I'll have that with, uh, can I get a side of brown gravy with, okay. with that for the fries? And uh, do you have like an English breakfast tea or a black yes. tea? Yeah, I'll have a, a tea please, thank you. Thank you. That's anyway, so uh, so Eli okay, so so yeah, so basically, Elijah Wood. Yeah, uh, Elijah Wood is what like he's like a, a savant piano player. Yeah, yeah, a genius. He was a he was the what do they call it prodigy of a composer and piano teacher called Paul something. I forget the name. Yeah, Paul something French. Swiss, I thought. Oh, because they brought the piano yes. over from Switzerland. Yes, they did. And there was something about Swiss bank account or something. No, there was, some, about there Swiss was something, bank something account. about in the extraordinarily long exposition. We're interviewing your wife, but we also have you on the phone scene. That was, was pretty weak. Yeah, that was pretty weak. While thank he was changing much. into the thank you, while he was changing into the tuxedo in the back of the limo on the way to this thing. Uh, they explained that there was like a hidden fortune or, a, or a un, a, an unfound family fortune. They sort of gave the, the the setup of the movie, as far as you're aware when you first start watching it anyway, is that Elijah Wood is a... Five years ago... Had, five years ago had a meltdown on stage and he's about to go and play live uh, for the first time in five years. It further transpires the reason he's going play for the first time in five years is it's sort of in memoriam of this big composer who who's who was his teacher yeah he's also going to be playing his piano yeah he's also going to be playing exactly which he's has been shipped at vast expense from, from switzerland, switzerland to chicago right, right. where um, the um 
they played at this the... This was a really good joke. And this, is a, this was a top joke, and probably the funniest thing in the film. They played at the Antoine Michel, Michel Hall, Hall. <laughs> which, which turned said... to me and said, is that not French for Anthony Michael Hall? <laughs> <laughs> which it is. Come which on. it is. Antoine Michel Hall. Is Antoine, is Antoine Michel Hall. And it wouldn't surprise me if that was... A, it was all over the place. Right. Well, no, no, there's a lot of... What's, what's hilarious about the movie... Is there is so a anyway, lot so of, we, there's a lot of plot should, to establish, we should, but <laughs> none of it really made any. Difference. Well, that's okay. So to Elijah that. Wood, five years, had a meltdown on stage, hasn't been back. He's married he's to an back. incredibly popular actress. He's married to an incredibly popular actress, and so he goes. So this is it, as far as we know. That's the setup. Right? Yeah, that's as the in, setup. His, his biggest fear is choking on stage again, and they're all making you know some people are making fun of him and all the rest. Of oh, it. and when he did choke, he choked on like the unplayable, the unplayable piece, piece could only be played by, by him. Like, or his teacher, right? That right. was it. That was it. There's and this then, unplayable. Well, no, because that's important to the end. No, end I know. I know. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not important. Which was utterly hilarious that that was important to the end of the movie. That this whole like unplayable piece, last and kept. Yeah, it was. Like, it was very weird because a lot of it was like the, the standard, like the idea of him like uh, conquering an unplayable piece would have its. It was sort of like. Because we should just start. That's basically it, right? The first mystery of the movie, I have to say, before we go any further. The first mystery of the movie, considering there was something like 15 different production companies on this film. Yes. There was like hundreds from Europe and from America and from all over. Yeah. Is that if one or two people read the script and went, I like it, let's make it, you could kind of understand it. But the fact that clearly committees of people had read the script of this movie and liked it enough to go, you know what, Elijah Wood, John Cusack, you've got They probably thought it was so bonkers (laughs) that it might be a hit. That's the only... Because... Right. Just, but it's John, John Cusack in it. It's clearly just going to go straight to video and disappear into the ephemera like a fire. Well, that, but again, that's the weird thing about it. Well, but the weird thing. A, so, because sometimes we get ahead of ourselves, and that's a good thing. But wait, 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 wait. So, I, I, Elijah I, Wood. Wait, no, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Elijah Wood, five years ago, meltdown, hasn't been back on stage. But before you... Goes, but, no, 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 but, but hasn't been back on stage, and then uh, uh, unplayable piece... Uh, that's what he choked on. Now he's back playing this guy's piano in memoriam for this for his teacher. His wife's there, and then he sits down at the piano, and it becomes apparent, um, which we'll get to. But it becomes apparent that there is a sniper. Sniper was the word I was looking for. Sniper is pointing a gun at him, and through an earpiece, com- in a convoluted way that he gets hold of, um, tells him he needs to play the this unplayable piece perfectly without hitting a wrong note or he and his wife will die and that's the setup of the movie yes. and now we can talk about why it was so bonkers but what happened was is I I get sent especially by Magnet and Magnolia right. uh, and anyone can sign up for this but I get sent a lot of the, the press releases and the trailers and the stuff right, right, right. for movies before they come out right and this one I was sent ages ago because it's been out on video on demand since last year. It's only just come out in the theatre now. Oh really? I didn't yeah, know yeah, yeah. That. It's been on video on demand since last year. Uh, and when I saw the trailer, and it was all like you know a Hitchcockian tense blah 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 blah, I was like, this is just phone booth yeah. but with a piano. <laughs> this is just like, right. and not only that, but think about how ludicrous that sentence is. This is just phone booth. The Colin Farrell, Larry Cohen scripted Forrest Whitaker movie with a piano. Yeah. Like yeah. adding the piano made it all sorts of mad, as far as I'm concerned. But this is what this is because what, I thought sorry. two things happened. Right, right. When I saw the trailer, and in the trailer he literally turns a, a page of the score over, and it has written on it like play this piece perfectly or you die, like exclamation mark in red, uh, scary writing. And when I saw that in the trailer, I was like, this is a joke. This this is not... Like, this is one of those movies made by those parody, like, spoof people. Right? Like, this isn't... <laughs> but it became apparent from the trailer that this was a, a to-be-taken-seriously 90-minute thriller. Like, a, like a, what occasionally they bring out these thrillers. So I thought to myself, I have to see this film only on the basis of how on earth do you make that premise serious and gripping 
back, you know, how do you do it? And the answer is you don't. The answer is <laughs> we are still waiting. It's not. Okay. The thing I was wanted to say earlier was, so there's all these things in it about the, you know, the pianist and the unplayable piece and the, you know, choking on stage and all that, that sort of demands... Which is certain, what's known as massive foreshadowing. No, right, but no, but no, no, but, but leaving, leaving that aside, yeah, 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 yeah. you could see it playing out in a way. Like if this was a French movie, right, right, that that would be, and he would have to play the unplayable piece, and, and, and everything springing from that. Like what you would get from that would be, um, like psychological or spiritual, right? Like would be the rewards for playing. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes, like there, yes sir. there's there's a movie out there where where Everything that happens in the movie without Cusack right. still has meaning and yep. still has whatever. Agreed. And then what they decided to do was to make those spiritual, psychological, like unsaid, as it were, but understood by the audience, rewards, like putting the fact that he choked behind him, moving on with his life, severing his ties with his teacher, you know, for good, and shadows of the whatever. And that would be the rewards. But in this case, the rewards are... We can't really go in. Can we go into it? I guess we can't really go into it. But it's more like a I, B movie. It's more like bolting on like B movie ideas onto this like French um, piece. It, it is almost like because it think, so doesn't work. Yeah. That it nearly works. Yeah. Like it's so fucking weird. Yeah. That it almost works. Yeah. Almost. I think that it's really close to work. I found in parts. Okay. This is very close to working. I've got a feeling like I would like to believe right. that all the European producers came with the movie that you're talking about. And then once it got to American shores... <laughs> once, once Cusack got involved. As John once like, Cusack's red pen got involved. Right, as John likes to say in this imaginary, like, big cigar chomping right, right, right. Hollywood exec, right. looked at it and went... You know what this movie needs, kid. Like I think that's just, what it was. This whole like his uh, his rewards. Uh, they get, get nah, out nah, of the nah, shadow, nah. don't they? Sniper. That's what you want. You want a sniper, and you want to make it all about some like mystery fortune. But see, thing. the problem is, and here, okay, that's here, what I like. To here's my here's my problem with the film, right? If I had to, uh, sorry, we're right near the kitchen. If I had to pinpoint my problem with the film, it would be that that guy wasn't involved. I think if that guy had been involved, I think it would have... cigar chomping. It didn't seem real, like, at heart, to have the... It was way too knowing and way too... um, Did you think so? Yeah, maybe. I don't even know if I do think that. See, I don't think it was too knowing. It did cast William William S. Preston Esquire as Cusack's henchman. I haven't seen him in a film since Bill and Ted's Bike this journey. I understand that, but I think that was more the fact that... I No, see, that didn't strike... It's interesting that that struck you as something where they were like, oh, we're going to put a couple of 80s people in the movie. I honest, Not necessarily 80s. I honestly think... To, I honestly think, because there's been Bill and Ted 3... Uh, rumors for a long while now. I honestly think he's, his agent is probably just trying to find movies to put him into. I honestly think that's it. I think we're going to see Alex Winter crop up in just a bunch of random movies, just so that his like faces out there. name and face is kind of out there again. I honestly think that's okay. Because right, cool. I think if anything is holding back, well, no. Now that uh, Keanu's had like a, bu- a bunch of massive flops as well, that's also holding it back. But I think that. The only thing, the other thing holding back the Bill and Ted Three is probably the Winter. People are like Winter Who, you know what I mean? Like he's made a couple of movies as a director. I think he's directed some TV, but I think it was probably just his agent saying we need to get him okay, out there, fine, rather than the director who was, I think, European, judging by the name, going, oh, we must get, uh, you know, uh, you Neil must get to be William Ted. S. Preston, yeah, right. Esquire. Yeah. I don't think that happened. I don't think that conversation was ever had. He was really good in it. I like Alex Winter in it. He was very good in it. They were all very good in it. Even Elijah Wood was very good in it. And I thought that the cinematography was really good. Like, I liked the stylish... There was a bunch of, like, Hitchcockian... It was, it was Hitchcock. Lynch, Lynch, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was Hitchcock from start to finish. It was a whole... And that's fine. Like, it was a Hitchcock movie, was what it was. It was a slightly ridiculous premise, done dead, dead straight, with a few bits of, like, incidental comedy. Right. Around, like, the like smaller actors, although no, nowhere near as 
charming as like Hitchcock. Hitchcock was never mean about his like smaller characters. Like, right. I don't, not particularly. Any. They were they were bumbling occasionally and whatever. But like the two guys in um, the Lady Vanishes who are like obsessed with getting back to London for the test match and things like that. Right. Like, they they get tiny bits of screen time, but the whole character. Uh, there's a little bit of that with the the actress's sister. I'm assuming. We have no. Boyfriend. We had that. That's the other thing. Is that we had no idea yeah, and who like, those two characters what are they even doing were. In this film? Right, other right, right. than we need to kill a couple of people. Yeah, so other than we yeah. need to kill a couple of people, so we better give them some lines first. But there was a which was which was howlingly obvious. Yeah, but it was like, because the the, the, four, quite, the four they, leads they did the, have the courage of their convictions. Like they did, it did stay on one. It did stay on one. Right? Like they did come up with a reason that it was happening. It wasn't just a bonkers bloke who needed the piano piece played. Right? Yes, it was fucking spurious and you know whatever. But they did come up with it. They didn't just go. Oh, we don't need that. No, but you see that you know bothered I mean? me even more. I wanted it to be like it would have been scarier. I think if it was some weird. Psychological, like the, the the thing, the film lost me when it revealed the twist. That's when the film completely lost yeah, me. Yeah, you're I was right. Just, it could have been a bit madder. I was just it could have gone more mad, and maybe that's what it needed. No, no, it, no, no. But it completely needed that. The first, the first. First of all, they gave it an incredibly long setup. Considering the trailer, it was gives, a long setup. Yeah, considering the trailer, considering the trailer gives away so much of what ultimately happens in the movie. Right. The the fact that the first what seemed almost like forty minutes before he even, even got to the stage, theater, right, right, right. or even took the stage, and a lot of it was padded. I mean, th- there was a lot. One thing that happened was again was very Hitchcockian. I had this whole thing of whenever anything's like a bit slow, we'll um, we'll have a camera doing things. No, no, and I but actually have to say that the setup was was okay. I had no problem kind of learning what he was about, and I had no problem with the. I had no problem with the exposition being kind of fitted into these scenes where his mind is on one thing right. and his character is thinking on that one thing right. and then the exposition is kind of happening although it is howlingly obvious the way it's written it's kind of happening for him, the character on the edge okay, of so his... Oh, oh that's just... Okay, cool. Wicked. Thank on the edge much. of his psychology. Do you know what I mean? Like... It's a radio interview that he's not fully paying attention to, or it's stuff in the theatre where he's really just focused on. Jesus Christ! It's absolutely, there's more blue cheese than there is burger. Yeah, it's um, amazing. Where he's focusing Sorry. on, you know, going into the dressing room and getting centred than he is really all this other stuff that's going on. Right, right, right. And that was nicely done. That was okay, and you got to know like who the composer was and the, uh, who the. Con- that's true. Con- I guess the doctor was his, rather. I wonder if it was one of those scripts. Because it was like written by one guy, just you know, one of those black. What do they call it? Comedy. Um, no, no, blacklist. Oh. Yeah, the famous unproduced script. I can see it being like a famous unproduced script. Do you know what I mean? I can see it being. There that. was a lot of like it. It surprised me. I thought because of the kind of cinema we saw it in. We saw it at the Village East oh. City Cinema, which is like a real uh, little indie artistic place. I worried that. Wait a minute. What if it isn't? The Grand Piano, but it's another movie called Grand Piano. Because when the movie titles came up, it was all this like European funding and like long names and things like that. And I was like, have we wandered into like a, <laughs> oh, no, I didn't a, a rescreening of Godard's Grand Piano? Which, I don't know, features a bunch of people sitting around a Grand Piano wandering the meaning of existence or whatever. Um, you know, and it was precursed by this kind of movie about these three guys and like the depth of three the, brothers, two worlds, one mission. mission. And like, but in the jungles of somewhere, like trying to uh, probably South America somewhere. It looked yeah. like a sequel to. Well, it, it, it badly sub- It was like really terrible subtitles. It was yeah. really bad subtitles. Based in a true story. And it I think was, you mean on? Uh, and it basically looked like a Gere Wrath of God, the sequel. That's basically what it looked mm. like. So, so I suddenly thought. Hang on, this cinema is not going to be screening bonkers thriller with Elijah Wood and John Cusack. We've wandered in here by mistake. Plus, there was a lot of roll neck goatee beards in the crowd. There were a lot of like, <laughs> like one and middle aged roll neck goatee. Yeah, beards. And, but but like the when we got there, as we were coming up, as we were coming up to the door. It's like incredibly old couple, like 85, 90 years old, right. trying to get through the door. 
And I turn across and go, what are they going to go? What are they doing going to see Grand Piano? Like, what yeah. part of them went, that's what we need to see. I yeah. guess because it looked like an old thriller. Like an old Hitchcock. And it was shot like an old Hitchcock. Like, there was one really cool was shot. the red curtain behind him. And no, no, that was really cool. No, no, I'm talking about, like, in terms of a camera trick. Where you had, like, a... The, um, there's a shot where you can see the stage and you can see this corridor of the theatre where this guy, um, security guard, uh, is like doing somebody in, right? And then after he does him in, it was quite cool. Um, it looked like it was all one shot, and presumably it was. But then it started focusing in on, the, on Elijah Wood on stage. No, that was a that was an optical effect. Yes, I know it's an optical effect, but I'm saying it was a neat idea. Oh, it was a really so neat to, idea. to frame the shot as if you were seeing both things, and then focus in on just one. Yeah. Like as if that half you were zooming in with only half the frame. No, no. The, very the cool. thing was, is as a as a bonkers thriller. Right. It's film great. Acted great. Yeah. The piano, I assume, miming was incredibly well done. Yes, I would agree with that. Unless it was a special effect where they CGI'd I someone else's so. hands on his. Whatever. What I was thinking was that bit when he was playing the piece at the end. Yeah. And you could see the mirror of his hand, and I could see that the mirrored version of the hands right. were slightly different from Elijah Woods. Uh, I wonder whether they didn't record somebody in this shiny surface playing the piece. Right. And then. Um, play it back to Elijah Wood um, in, a, in a way that he could follow on just afterwards right. and then match the two things up. Right. So it looked like... Or they I did... Know, but I think, I think the bit where they rack-focused on his face on the piano, upturned piano lid, I think the hands were someone else's and his face was right, clearly like right, CGI'd right. in. But have got the brown gravy? Sure. Um, but no, apart from that, it was really well done. Like, Great. Really well done, really yeah. well filmed, nice cinematography, a little bit of stylized, blah, 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 blah. Everyone played their roles perfect. Yes. So why? I have no idea whether I liked it or not. Yeah. I, I Which have... means I don't, but I didn't not like it. I did not like it. I honestly believe, I honestly think, the twist was the problem with the film. Because it was so ham-fisted the way it was done. Basically, Cusack is communicating with both Elijah Wood on stage and Alex Winter as his henchman, right? And then somewhere along the line, the the the, the wires cross, and Wood is able to hear what Cusack is saying to Winters, and that's how the twist is revealed. Yes. Perfect. Thanks. And I have to say. And then Cusack's character immediately changes tack and is like, oh, now you know the twist, it doesn't matter. And just went on with it as if that was always his plan. It, like, it, I don't know, I'm not... Cause he, I, but I understand what you're saying. Like, I understand it's a temptation to find a moment in the film where no, that was the thing, but... I was like, I don't know whether I like this or not, up until, and that's quite late on in the movie. Like, right, it's right, three right. quarters of it's gone by, and already I'm thinking... I've got no idea whether I like this or not. Like, in theory, I like it. Yeah. It's, I've got no problem with... The only thing I could think of, right, was... You know when a band does, like, a blatant rip-off of somebody else? Yeah. But it's done with a sort of a joy and a... In a way that you can enjoy it. Right. Um, I'm trying to give a good example here. Yeah. Oh, wait, it's just from the Beatles. No, no, I mean, like... Oh. Like back in the USSR and the Beach Boys. Right, Beatles you know what I mean? Like, Beach Boys. Yeah, yeah. Like, like not taking the piss. Although that's sort of taking the piss, actually. But, um, more like a, like a joyous time. Like a, the, the only example I can think of, you're just going to have to rumble on this one, even though you're going to hate it, is um, uh, uh, Placebo did a song called You Don't Care About Us that might as well have just been an old cure song. That they right, up. right, right. But it's, you know, it's done with like, I know this sounds like somebody else. But it's you know joyous and reverent, you know, right? And 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 it's meant to be like, well, we really love these songs. We want to do one like it. And there was a bit of that going on with like this guy and Hitchcock. But there were bits. Of, I just can't help feeling that Hitchcock would have hired some. Even though like Elijah was very good, I think he would have he would have made his character more interesting. There wasn't much at stake for Elijah, other than. Like, I understand the temptation to make him, like, the, the piano, like, this, like, a rock star guy, and, you know, and he's a, as big a celebrity as she is, and all that kind of nonsense. 
and that's okay, that's fine. You know, I'm sure Hitchcock would have done something similar. But like, I don't know, he would have made him funny or... Um, no, I know what it is. Like I've sardonic. Got it. No, 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 or... I've got it. None of this is, is, is important. Oh, my apologies. No, no, I don't mean it like that. What I mean is, is it, it, it's important to what you're saying. Yes, I agree, but I mean it's not important to why the film doesn't work. No, just quickly. You know, I know why the film Do you not work. agree? I know why the film doesn't work. Okay, no. But do you not agree that Hitchcock would have made the piano player much more likeable? And therefore, putting him through the mill in the way that he did, like he does with all of his characters, or right. at least in the, in the films that he's in particular referencing, uh -huh. makes you um, you go along with it a lot more because you actually really do give a shit about the central character. You give a shit about Jimmy Stewart. You give a well, shit about... You yes know what I mean? and no. I actually think that he would have made the villain more like him. If you look at his best, like Strangers on a Train or whatever... Right. Farley Granger is not particularly that's true okay. likeable but Bruno is like really enigmatic and I think like bonkers that, but, but I'm thinking when he put his, his innocent real window in you're right yeah yeah I mean um, Robert Donat in 39 Steps Jimmy Stewart in Rear Window right. Gary Grant in North by Northwest yeah. the innocent guy gets put through the ring right. he has so much sympathy for the innocent guy because of whatever mad thing he's going to Hitchcock's head yeah 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 but when he puts him through the ringer like that, there's a slight bit of joy in putting an innocent guy through the ringer, like coming up with these set pieces, coming up with these ideas. But because he's a nice guy, you know he's going to be all right. You know what I mean? You know he's going to be okay, and he's going to get through it with like some wit and some style. And there was no... like Elijah was very good, but he was fired purely because... I've got it. I know what... I... He looks frightened. He looks like... He does frighten very well. He looks like a hamster <laughs> had a gun put to his head and told to play the piano. Like, a total... And that works really well, but it's a lot... Sorry, rather, it's not enough to carry a whole movie, but I've been whittering on because no, you no. know why it didn't work. It didn't work because you've set it up. The reason why the twist bothers me and why it takes away and why the ending was able to be the way it was utterly stupid it was the, with her getting up and singing and all that was just utterly stupid the reason why you could do that is if you set it up so that only he can press those notes in that order to make the thing happen all threat of him being shot or her being shot or anything is completely out the window. That's, That's the problem with it. That's true. If you had made it a psychological thing where even if it was like my dad, because like, I thought it was going to be, Kusang was going to be like this guy's son or this like previous, I thought that previous too. pupil I thought or whatever that too. it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you had him being like, well, he never loved me and he loved you more yeah, than the thing or whatever it was. I thought what it was going to be was that the teacher was so upset so angry that he's fucked it up that he's thrown it all away right. was so bitter right. and like his family member or even if it had been actually him like putting him to go this is the only way I can get you to play this fucking piece right right right, 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 right. something mad like, like if they'd gone they got too focused on playing the piece and it should have been more about the reason why phone booth works to some extent is that it's all about um, or initially in the setup it's all about here is this flawed individual and this guy is trying to teach him a lesson. And it doesn't matter what else happens. It doesn't matter how many police show up or who he has to shoot or anything like that. It's all about just teaching this one guy a lesson initially. And there's other spurious things that come out later on in the movie. But that's the key. What other spurious things come out later? I forget. It's a really good film, but I forget. I didn't enjoy it. But that, you I, feel, I feel for Colin Farrell because I do actually quite like him. I think he's quite good. No, no. Well, Larry Cohen always writes really great. He never script. made an outside. That was his problem. Farrell, he needed to make an outside. An anyway. Outside. In this movie, there was no big thing about Elijah Wood except the fact that he choked five years ago on a right. piece that we don't care about, we don't know right. about, whatever, right? So we're meant to we're meant to feel the weight of him getting back on stage, but the weight of him getting back on stage has nothing to do with the fact that there's a sniper in the audience. It's just to do with the fact that he like choked last time he was on stage. Like all that's at stake is a little bit of fame and a little bit of. Celebrity. But not even that, because you know you're right. Because you're, the problem with that, of course, is it's all bollocks. Like it's fine that it's bollocks. Right. It's fine that of course nobody gives a shit that Elijah Wood choked five years ago. We don't live in a world where people who play the piano 
actually choke and run off stage. And if they do, nobody cares, except the people who presumably ask for their money back. But that was it. No one else is going to remember it. It's certainly not going to be like... But the, the idea of it being on talk shows and that people care and him being a stuff, that's fine. But it's just, you know, for the world of the movie, it's not real. So that's what it's paying for. It's nonsense. It might have worked. Yeah. It might have worked. It might have worked if I'm sorry. It might have worked if him, him and the wife hadn't been together. Right. If by going through all this nonsense he and saving her, her life, he won her. Back. But they had a wonderful relationship. Right. She'd set everything and up for him. Thing about, oh, she's more famous than you are, and you're bitter about it. I've seen nothing of that. Right. Nothing. Right. You can't like make so, any sense. None of that mattered. But the only reason any of that was in there in the first place about him choking in the unplayable piece and blah 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 was well, because of the twist right. but the twist ultimately doesn't matter because once you introduce the twist if he just gets up and walks off stage and whatever okay yes his wife gets shot or he gets shot or whatever but like once once the assassin or the sniper shoots those people he's got no leverage he's got nothing he can yeah, do also this, uh, if yeah. we're meant to believe that the only way to make the piano work, not to want to spoil anything, is to play that those last four bars exactly correct. Right. Right? Right. Um, then he is the only person who can do it. If yeah. we take out of our brain the fact that you could probably take a fucking axe to it or whatever, or even the fact that Cusack, Cusack was meant to have designed it, so therefore he probably could have figured it out. And it, like... Yes. None right. of that. So what I'm saying, you have to take all that out of your mind, to sus- suspend this belief, and have all this belief in this unplayable piece and this unknowable result of the unplayable piece. So, right. Which is way too much for us to take on faith or buy into. Whereas, if it was um, innocent guy being put through the ringer and having his life threatened and all the rest of it, and the playing of the piece was simply just some sort of psychological game rather than some ultimate whatever. It makes it a far more... He can't just do what he does at the end. He can't just go, well, I'm going to play a wrong stand-up and have her sing a song. That was weird, because that that bit as well, like that bit lasted too long. Because it was was a whole bit. You should never have... If your whole setup of your film is this guy's threatening this other guy, he's holding something over his head. If it reaches a point where you go, what are you doing, what are you doing, sit down, play the thing, play the thing. I, don't, like, it, I guess it kind of worked because he, it beca- he became impotent, but it was just, none of that, none of that bit made any sense. Like, why is she standing up? Like, what is that? Because I was thinking, is this, does this mean that, like, if he gets everybody to stand up that he can't see and she stays sitting down, that might work. Like, some reason for it to happen, but not. And then Winter's like, oh, it's all over, let's go. How is it all over? It was just, that's what I mean. You're right. You the twist was right. the problem. Yeah, you're right. It was the problem. The setup was fine. The twist was the problem. Because it asked us to buy into something we had previously no knowledge of. In a situation where we don't like Cusack and we like Wood. I'm not sure the twist was the problem so much, though. But there was no reason for Elijah Wood to know. Right? There's no reason for him to know. But that's what's going on, really. I mean, I, I get that, so he can make a choice at the end. But like, why? Why is he making that? There's no reason Plus, why there's he this makes big that realization choice. at the end. Where I think the personal journey was meant to be that big realization at the end, because the conductor said to him, "You're not the greatest pianist because you play all the right notes. You're the greatest pianist because you have this incredible expression in what you're playing." And the audience doesn't give a shit if you play a wrong note. Everyone plays a wrong note. It's this incredibly dense, complicated piece of music. So don't worry about it. Play from your heart and balls to the exactly right notes. And then there was this really weird bit at the end where he played a wrong note specifically in order to like finish the whole drama, where he went, the audience will never know. Like it was some realisation. And I think that was meant to be his realisation of, oh, why am I afraid to go on stage? I know I can play this blah, 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 blah. So why does it matter? Also, I might add, if we're meant to buy into the fact that he's so afraid on stage, but then within 30 seconds of him getting on stage, we're meant to believe he could also then play through a a guy holding a gun to his wife and to him while also texting and doing a bunch of mad acrobatics. I can can sort of of see that because I think 
part, and again, they could have had a bit more fun with it. But I think the point of that bit was no. I think um, they had too much fun with it. I think it was ridiculous. I didn't mind it because they could have overdone that. There was only one real bit ridiculous. But I didn't mind it because I think the idea was well, he's not think, whatever's going on, whatever's wrong with him playing, it's all in his head. So all of these things, him talking to him, pulling the gun on him, all that, is actually like getting him to focus on something else. Except that when I watched the trailer, I honestly thought that the playing of the piece, I didn't realise it was just going to be the last four bars of that last piece. I think, okay, that's the problem with, seriously, that's the problem with the I don't think that's the problem. I, I, I think it you're right. I think it's a big problem. I think the problem was there were no stakes at all. Thank you very much for enlightening me. Like, well, the state, no, no, but, this is, but, but the reason why there are no stakes is what I'm talking about. Because if he shoots Elijah Wood, right, he can't get the whatever it, it is. It only works. He can't get what the twist is if he shoots him in the head, right? So at a certain point, that's why there are no stakes. There are no stakes I would have liked if he shot him in the foot or something, and he had to play with, like, a bleeding foot. That would have been fun. Right, but I'm telling you, Meaning that he has to do a certain thing in order for there to be some game, let's say, right. at the end for the sniper. Right. More than him just playing a perfect piece or teaching him some sort of mental and or emotional lesson. It's immediately taken away. Uh, or the threat of shooting in the head is immediately taken away if he's the only person who can do that left on the platform. I agree. Or one of three or four. Let me ask you a question. Because I, I, I do agree with you. I do. I think you're right. I think the, the, what the twist was and how it was revealed. I mean, it's not... By the way, we should... Because it, it must be difficult to listen to this. It's not a twist like, it turns out that Elijah Wood is really an alien or, I don't know, that it's not a dream or anything like that. Well, yeah, true. It's more that... It's a ridiculous premise. You might like. Uh, ha- we've explained the premise. It's ridiculous. And they 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 have come no, up. We can say no, no, no. But no, no. But I'm just saying. But they they come up with a way of justifying why it's a ridiculous premise. I.e., there's a reason, an actual reason why he must play the piano without hit, without hitting a wrong note. There's a reason for this. Yeah, but. It's nonsense. I mean, it's no, no, of course, no, no. I agree. I agree. With you. I, I, I think a way to rescue it, although it's not the film that it would would make. And then the but way, a way they... to rescue the premise, like I said, but it wouldn't be a thriller. Which would be to make it a horror thing, and make it like an Argento thing, where the guy who's holding the sniper to him is doing it for artistic reasons. He is the long day composer come back to life, and then you make a horror film. You make you know him killing people backstage and but it, like, well, it doesn't even have, But it doesn't even have to be no, because I, I thought when they went with the. Um... They killed the actress's sister or whatever up in the bathroom. I thought that was going to be like a, a, a giallo Argento bit. Yeah, as well. the bit with the mirror thing. And there was aspects of it. There was certainly aspects of giallo there without the the um, bloodletting. But they clearly. What I'm trying to say is they clearly believed in the twist because the very very last scene in the entire film. And that feels so tacked on. Also, hinges. why is she a famous Hollywood actress? Why does that matter? Because as far as I'm concerned, that undermines the ending completely. Because it's like, right. well, they don't need it. Yeah, 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 they don't yeah. need it. No. So, and like, her being a famous Hollywood actress brings nothing to the film, except there's like weird shots of like her being hassled and, you know, what is that? Why does this matter? I don't understand why this matters. And if it you know was, what I mean? And if it was a, a Giallo movie, it wouldn't matter. If it was a Giallo movie, it would just be like, oh, people who are hanging out, they're famous, aren't they, or whatever. It wouldn't matter. Maybe, like, maybe because in, like... In Giallo movies, in a there's Hitchcock, always no, in a Hitchcock someone Hitchcock movie, who, there's lots of, like, famous actresses and whatnot. Like, right. Is it, like... No, no, not Grace Kelly, really. Like, yeah, she's, she's famous. Is she famous? Oh, yeah, yeah, big time. So that's what, that's right. He's a photographer and she's a fan. So that's where they've nicked that from. Yeah. She's supposed to be Grace Kelly. Even though I've never seen anybody less striking or... Like, hire somebody with a mad face and say, this is a favourite time. And actually go, all right, well, she's got a mad... I can, but she's so... Like, she, she wouldn't even warrant... Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm really stuffed. The, the blue cheeseburger was terrific. 
But she wouldn't even merit a bit part in a CSI in Miami. She's got such a bland, forgettable face. She's actually a really good actress, Karen Boucher, but anyway. Oh, what's she been in? She's been in Argo, she's been in Red State, she's been in a bunch of stuff. What was she in Argo? One of the um, people hiding out in the Canadian oh. embassy. I guess it wasn't much of a part. But she didn't... Okay, maybe she's a really good actress. But then you don't hire a good actress for that part. You no, you hire don't. somebody no, no. glamorous. Right. Even the Darth Sisko, who looked more like... All right, she was like a parody, but that's okay. Like, you're making... Look at the movie you're making. Like, switch those parts around. She probably had more to do, acting and right. comic timing and all the rest of it, than the, than the bland one did anyway. So why not, like, switch the parts around? Say, so, look, you both both basically got the same amount of screen time but this one has a lot more fun and this one just needs to look right. and I think that might have been I don't know that might have been a bit more interesting and I, I would other than Elijah Wood's capacity to look scared and just about be a name above a move I don't see what he I would prefer Cusack to have been the peer because he's got a mad face I can believe he hasn't played the piano in five years you know and, and I think he would like I don't know I just think he carried the premise better. It was, it was, it was really, really. What was incredible about it is it was really well put together. It was, and it clearly had a lot of financing and backing and other stuff and all the rest. And of it. a lot of determination, like nobody... and a lot of determination. And and think about what Elijah Wood, even if a lot of it was fake, think about what he actually had to prepare for the role in order to pull off. He was very good. Like I did buy him. I bought him more than I bought. A lot of the rubbish that was going on. Right. And Cusack was clearly a trying to do it because he was like, well, this will be my fourth movie shot in either Canada or Bulgaria this year, and all I have to do for this is mainly I'm, voiceover. I am literally phoning this in. Yeah. Like he's lit. I wouldn't surprise me if he did literally phone, phone it. I, in. I like that they did that. They because the, the thing they did except in phone when booth he, except the bothered when the, me. What? This thing in phone booth. Where, at the very end. When no, you're no, 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 no. The, the in phone booth that Keith Sutherland's voice was clear as a bell as if he was like next to the microphone it didn't have him sounding like he was on the end of the phone that bothered me right but that's a studio decision that's of course like, uh, of course that's a of course we've got but Keith saying, but I did why like are we that. not like yeah. why are we not hearing it yeah as opposed to now you go who yeah which would be fine but Cusack, I liked that they did that with his with his voice. I, I thought that worked quite well. There were a couple of there was there were too many things in it that. Um, but then I guess they were bits. But then I, I suppose that was quite clever too. There were bits in the movie that dragged. Was that you know, the story's been put in motion, but there's still a, like a way to go. We've just got some things that need to happen that are not particularly interesting. Where he did some like you know fun visual tricks. And, you know, mucked about with stuff and like pulled away from Elijah Wood during the conversation to have you hear what Cusack's voice was sounding like and what his point of view was and then just zoom back into Elijah Wood again. It didn't mean anything, it didn't go anywhere. But it's like, why don't I just do this? Because obviously it's a boring conversation and we've got to keep it moving. And I think they were aware we have to keep it moving. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think that, I'm honestly telling you, I think that the twist meant there was a whole investment in something that wasn't the key to the movie. Agreed. Because you had, but you had the to worst see, part. Was you it. had to see the piano being packed up and moved into the thing. You had the, like, what I'm trying to say is, there had to be all this emphasis on these things we never got to see, right? So we never got to see him choking. We never got. That to was see, that was an odd choice. I thought there was. We never got to see him training. There training with the, the right. composer we never had we had no frame of reference for whatever this unplayable piece was right um, or their relationship or their relationship we had yeah none of that and yet had it been any other twist had it been the psychological thing had it been the emotional thing had it been a lesson had it been had the um, like in phone booth the exposition of who this character is is, is done throughout the taunting by the by the crazy person because we don't know how bad Farrell is until you know halfway through the movie when he starts revealing yeah but you have this girlfriend here and you have to blah blah blah, blah. so that's I, I feel like if that's that's how they should have done it and I know that is literally phone booth with a piano rather than whatever movie they were trying to say but all what I'm trying to do is whatever movie they tried to make with this twist that was meant to be all important didn't work so it had to be something else I, no, I agree I agree I, I, I wonder whether 
I think my bigger problem with this film is that they were still married and that she was a famous Hollywood actress. So I think they thought it was saying something about like that it meant there was something at stake for Elijah Wood. I.e. he has to succeed in order to I don't know, it was so fuzzy. But making her famous, making her a big star, and make it seemed to be nothing more than a call out to Hitchcock films, without really any thought of what that might mean for the underlying, you know, um, motivations of the movie. The whole movie was like that. It was no, all no, a call-out Hitchcock films without I, any realisation of what any of that well, meant. Well, yeah, see, that's the problem, I think. And that's, I think that's... Hitchcock films are always tied to something in his own head. Like, he was obviously a deeply strange man, Hitchcock, right? Funny. Um, uh, interesting, thoughtful, intelligent guy. But obviously deeply troubled right. and using these movies not to work things out but the, what he thought was entertaining and what he thought was funny um, thank you very much uh, uh, no I had tea it's fine thank you thanks. Um, whatever uh, happened in the movies was somehow a reflection of how he thought them, what amused him you know, what amused him and that was it but at least it was him whereas this was more like let's just take bits and pieces from other films and it, there wasn't anything my, I think my your thing is a twist that's fine I understand why you think that I think my problem with it was making they her they hung everything on it making her a famous Hollywood actress meant that he had nothing to the, the, the prize as it were the twist had no meaning for him he didn't need it if he maybe needed it if it meant something to him personally, it didn't even need to be, you know, what it was. It could have been something else, but it could have meant something to him personally. And then it's at, at least a bit like, well, maybe part of it, because a lot of these movies, like, maybe part of him wants to play it, wants to play it right and find, and get this thing or find out this thing or whatever it is that you end up choosing. But I'm telling you, his personal journey was not that. His personal journey no, I know, was, I know. was the realisation that the audience doesn't care. I agree, but who, that doesn't... His realization was, "What am I afraid of? I know I can, I know I can sit at the piano and bang out these incredible pieces. I know I can do that. I'm afraid because I think that the audience wants perfection because they have this big idea of who I am." Oh uh, yeah, okay. So the realization is that they don't need perfection; they just need me to be up there and whatever. Yeah, it's like, okay, okay. It's like when you go to see, I don't know, Eric Clapton. You don't necessarily need him to play the Layla solo exactly like it is but on then the... But if, if they needed to... I, I agree with you. I, I think you're right. But then that could have been better illustrated if they hadn't been together, if she hadn't been... Or even if she had been a fan of her actually, if they hadn't been together, right? If he wins her back by doing all this stuff, then, as you're saying, the way that he plays in front of her, he's finally being himself. He's not, like, retreating from the stage, crippled by self-doubt or whatever, which is one of the reasons why she left him. Right? right. So if he plays the piece perfectly, and what he actually gains from it is her rather than the thing. If she's a famous horror actress, and the, then she he gains that anyway. Like he doesn't need this thing. He doesn't need to play the thing at the end and get the whatever. Right. That that's, but the, but that's that totally comes down to the twist. Yeah. Yeah. So it would have been funny. It would have been funny if he went in. Oh, agree. Okay. Agree. But I'm saying my problem with it was more than the twist. I think. I think there's a way to have made that to have made that twist work. But I think it wouldn't, it couldn't have worked as long as she's a famous Hollywood actress and she's still married to him. If they're happy together, there's a way to, there's a way to illustrate, right? I, I'll tell you what. There's a way to illustrate what she means to him if they're not, to, yeah, if they're not together, right? And he wants to be with her. Right. There's a way to illustrate that without her being in the room. It's very difficult to illustrate that they're happy and that he loves her and everything's great and that he'll do anything for her if she if they're never in the room together. Right. Do you see what I mean? Like mm -hmm. that's the, like they can't be in the room together. That's part of the uh, 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 conceit of the film. Right. If that ruins whatever's going on, if that ever happens, right. or at least for them to ever have an honest conversation. But you don't need that. She can be like a shining, you know, thing in a spot like Mars away. If he's still in love with her, but she doesn't love him. Like, that's okay. That's cool. And him getting her to sing at the end and all that, that makes sense if he's like, you know, I don't know, something. But without that, with them being happy together, there's nothing at stake for him except for he needs to win something. It's already been established five seconds after he sits down and starts playing that he can sit on a stage and play the piano. 
Yeah. Like, it's, it's done. So that journey is over. <laughs> like, yeah, no, as no. soon as that happens, that's over. But everything you're saying is exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying no, the no, only reason I'm you saying feel this way about it is because the twist was what it was. But I'm saying the twist being what it was. Um, only... You're saying it could have worked, and I'm saying, no, 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 rewrite right. the whole thing. Well, that's thing. where we disagree. That's okay. Right. But I say, I think is a way to make that work if they're not together. Right. But it's not a... I think, if you want to know what I think, I'd be very surprised. The other problem is, right, is right. if he's been planning it for three years, right. which is what Cusack said at a certain point, I've been planning this goddamn thing for three years, right? Right. right. What's he been planning for three years? Because apparently we're also led to believe throughout the whole movie that she has planned this whole thing to get Elijah Wood back on stage because she loves him so much and she thinks that the world needs to hear his stuff. Even though probably the majority of the world doesn't give a shit. But again, so what I'm saying is, her being a Hollywood actress, the reason why they kept it, the, the reason why they're happy in them, is their impetus for him getting on stage. Right? And then there's some spurious reason about how it has to be this piano and blah, 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 blah. But none of that... Like, are we meant to believe that Cusack arranged for it to be this piano, or what? Like, and if Cusack has the ability and the money and the ingenuity to do that, what? that's what doesn't hold together either. Like, once oh, you yeah. start picking apart... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, this is... That you can you know privately can you just do your a grand piano. Can you just right now do your spoiler alert song? Yeah. to do. There's a key in the piano that's going to give people a shitload of money. Um, Imagine the... Is unbelievable. Fucking stupid. Because all he needs is an axe and five minutes alone with that piano. Right. Not and only he gets that, the key. but he designed the lock right. that releases the key. So, the whole thing is built on a lot of spirit sources anyway. End of spoiler. End also... Of, wait, wait, because well, we need to end the spoiler. Hang on a second. Also, also, the, it's based on not the whole piece, but four bars at the end. Right. Yet he only plays one wrong note. So what would be to stop, like, Cusack, like, going and, like, playing the right note? Or, like, none of it meant that, any their problem is that, that their problem really is they're all really strokey beard, clever, everybody involved in this movie. And they, they were so tickled. They were so tickled by how ridiculous the movie was. That they didn't care that, that it doesn't matter if you're making a stupid movie. Like Larry Cohen and Phone Booth, he gets it. it. Okay, it can be a stupid idea, but it still has to make sense, or you're never going to bring them with Within you. Within the realm of with, the movie. Right, you're never going to bring them with you unless when, when you get them, you hook them in, and you keep them in by having the internal logic of the movie make sense. If it's built on something that they will never, ever buy in a month of Sundays, then you haven't made a also, very good there was, movie. there was one bit where Alex Winter was was uh, coming up with other ways they could do this. Yeah, and he went, and how Kusak, would that work? And he went, and Kusak much said, better than this. Yeah, Cusack <laughs> said, what did you want me to do? Hijack the piano on the way to America and, like, break it apart then or something? And I was thinking, yeah. <laughs> well, he goes, I mean, you know, what do you want to do? You want me to kidnap Elijah Wood and hold a gun to his head? Yes. Yes. That would also work. Yeah. You know, and Elijah Wood would go, all right, and do it, yeah. and you get the key. You wouldn't have to explain anything to him. Right. And, and, by like, the time... and like you say, because his, because his whole thing is he's an incredibly gifted pianist and he's married to, we're meant to believe, an incredibly attractive Hollywood actress, right. this ultimate game, like is what you're saying, is, uh, whatever's locked in the, in the box that the key and the piano unlocks, this double the most ama- amazing amount of money you could possibly think of means nothing thing means absolutely because nothing. she's a famous artist but you know what you know what the problem is because they were all strokey beard no what a ridiculous conceit how clever of us to make this film <laughs> even though it's so ridiculous right. is they think it's enough that 
this whole you know figuring out why I have to play. Well, that's important. That's why we can hang the whole movie on the fact that it's important to be able to play, you know, to be able to play the piano, to be able to express art far more than money. And all of a sudden, like, because they're straight beard asses, that's what's important. You can't set up a film where all this stuff is happening on the back of money and then make it all about... And it's fine if that's what it is, but it can't be wispy, wispy, indie movie, you know, ethereal nonsense if you're going to make a film that you just made. Right. If you want to say that, that's fine. But figure out a way to say it. Don't just make it like, well, that, I don't know. It's yeah. just... It, what's weird is, the reason why it threw us completely is that it was so, like, perfectly made. Yeah, it was perfectly made. And it did have... Perfectly I, I may be being a, I may be being a little bit cruel with the whole strokey beard we're terribly clever. Although I, I'm sure that is kind of what was happening. They did mean it. They did stick it. They weren't, like, snide to people. Or smug. And it, it had the courage of its premise. It wanted to see it through to the end. I just think I would be interested to read the script before the director and producer spoke. Because I wonder if the twist was revealed in the way that it was revealed. If him and the actress were together if she even was an actress like these things get no, changed no, I, um, well, in pre-production that, that no no, but, no, that no, no, no but they do, the, no, they, no, do. Him, they get a script they go this is great this is great this is great yeah except that him and her that. being together I think like you're right in saying is a, is a purposeful nod to Rear Window right but that's what I'm saying it's the sort of thing they would change in the script because it would strike them as amusing to call out to Rear Window okay. without understanding what that would mean and when a script writer I think that's puts a, a script. script together I don't know I'm not sure I would be. I, I'm not saying it would. It would it's I'm necessarily saying, the case. I just wonder whether, given the film got, sometimes scripts get made because of their very strong scripts. Right. But then they get changed when they put them on screen because things need to change. Understood. But I, I'm I, wondering whether, in the way that it was changed, it lost whatever tiny thread it held them by when it, when they were reading it. And I would say, when that happens. It's normally more obvious. I would say if it was changed in this case, in the ways that you are saying, it would be being changed by... Um, th there would be too many pieces to change because the twist as it is and the whole... When you look at it with hindsight and knowing the twist and going back over the movie, that is being set up right at the very beginning. That is the entire through line of the whole film. And the only reason it throws you and doesn't make any sense as you're watching it is because you don't know that bit of information. Like, if I went back and watched it now, knowing that bit of information, it would maybe play out differently. But I'm saying that the little bits of that are throughout the whole film. And I'm saying that's where the... That's, for me, where the film lost it. Because I, I do agree and, and so I'm saying I don't think it's a case of where someone came in and went well we need to keep these two together or we need to do this we need to do that because I think that with such a structured script a lot of that would have been obvious if you'd gone well hang on what I'm trying to say is within the script there are no massive howling errors in, in terms of A to B to C as in the script there are howling errors when you're a human being watching the movie going well okay that doesn't make sense that doesn't make sense that doesn't make sense but there's no massive like left turns that would be made if someone suddenly went well I don't like the fact that they're apart let's make them together because if they were apart so much of the script would have had to have been changed that, that everything else would have unraveled and fallen you couldn't just it, it, it couldn't be a change that was just made in like a few lines Fair it enough. would have had to have changed the entire tone of the piece because you would have had to have had a whole beginning bit where they were at odds and you would have had to have had a whole bit at the end where they came together like it but, would have been but it does feel like the film mood. missed those bits right but that's because like it missed interactions that, between right, the two but that's because you're coming at it from a, these are the other films I've watched where this has happened. Yeah, and I am yeah, yeah. too. I'm coming at it from a point of here are some other movies in which your average Joe is terrorized by X, Y, and Z. 
and this is how they've done it, and this has been pleasing Revenge to... Revenge of the Alphabet, yeah. I've seen that one. Right, whatever it is. But pleasing to me, this is what was pleasing and, 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 and sorted itself out for me and left me with a feeling of, oh, OK, so that was a nonsense thriller, but it was a nonsense thriller that resolved itself in a way that yeah. left you with a, a catharsis. Like, what, like what, what we were talking about um, Peter Hyams the other week, like, he will draw you into this yeah. and he will make it make sense. Yeah. Even if it is a bit ridiculous, he will yeah. take you along for the ride whereas, and make it make sense. Whereas, and that is a big talent. Right, whereas the problem with, with this film, uh, your changes to the script are based on previous films you've seen where something was satisfactory to you. And my changes to the script are based on previous films that have been satisfactory to me, no matter how B-movie or right, made for TV are. Right, right. And you could maybe say that the, one of the plus points in this movie was the fact that it, you know, there wasn't a uh, something we expected to see coming. In other words, it wasn't a, he was my father and he never loved me, he loved you more than me, so therefore I'm going to torture you and blah, blah, blah. There wasn't that. There was this other thing. The problem with the other thing that they picked and the problem with the scenario that they chose to play out was that ultimately it wasn't satisfying. And therefore there is a reason why those conventions are in place in the first place. It's because you leave the theatre going, well, that was a bonkers thriller, but it was satisfying. Right, right, right. I see you know what you're saying. I mean? Yeah, yeah, I agree with you, yeah. And yet what they, tried, what they tried to do here was they tried to have all the beats of a satisfying movie right down to the inexplicable fight in a high place above the piano at the end with like Cusack who's a sniper so therefore he's probably pretty handy with his fist and Elijah Wood who's like this three foot piano player but I liked that that was you liked it because it was a bonkers thriller trope, but it makes absolutely no sense in regards to everything else that went on they only put it in there because it's a bonkers thriller trope. no no I agree no, but I'm saying Cusack did um beat the shit out of Elijah Wood but in the process of beating the shit out of him lost his gun and while stretching for the gun but beating had, it, beating the shit out of him doesn't get him his magical key no that's true it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't and if he was that angry with him like he might he, he might have been better off you know what it's, that's the trouble with him. The trouble with the whole movie. Is do, you know what he would always, be, do you know what he'd be better off doing? Anything else? <laughs> he would be better off, I'm not even kidding, <laughs> waiting for the whole thing to end, and as the piano was being wheeled to the truck, hiding under the piano, getting into the truck with the piano, and then figuring out whatever he needed to do to get the key that is the while problem. the truck was going that to That is the problem with the whole movie. You know what? This, the trouble with the whole movie is when you start thinking about, oh, maybe they could have done this, maybe they could have done that, you go, no, 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 none of that, none of that. The central thing that he's trying to do could be achieved in any number of easier ways yeah. that wouldn't, by the way, lead to him being arrested. And I get that you're making a silly movie, and that's fine. Oh, and also you can't have a thriller where at the end, where your leading man and your leading villain fall from the sky and go crashing into a massive grand piano, elicit laughter from the audience. You just can't have one. That's true. But I, they I fell did like, I into did the like. piano like a pair of like a pair of a sack of spuds. You can't have an audience. There were so many nice. But this is the thing. Here's the thing. Because we're, we're coming off at it bad. But there were so many nice things in the movie. No, it was really well made. The, the, the joke about Kizak's foot still moving. You know, after he hit the piano, the the, the look on Elijah Wood's face where uh, and and Kizak's face where Kizak realised that Elijah Wood was trying to pull him out. It wasn't letting go. But even though Cusack was trying to save him, he didn't want to be saved. He wanted to pull him over. That and the look on Cusack's face when he did that, that was fun, that was interesting. That was cool. There was loads of it that was cool and interesting. It looked great and there was some fun things going on. The, the mirror and the, the, the you know, slit in the throat with the, with the cello thing. That was very, you know, there were loads of things about it that were really super cool. And there were loads of bits of it. Like, even though this is fucking bananas, I've never seen anything like it. I mean, other than obviously Hitchcock. And I'm quite enjoying that they are at least having fun with it and keeping a straight face. Yeah, it was made by someone but, who has watched a film or two in the past. Right, but as you said, the problem is, is that it gets to a point where they have to really explain why this is all happening and it comes up short. That's the problem. You don't for a minute. That's what I said at the beginning. Right. 
I agree with you. I mean, I still think it could have been rescued with that conceit in place, but I do see that the reason it lost us in that movie that we just saw well, because was, was that. I do see that. Because the reason why psychological trauma is a decent get-out for most scriptwriters to explain the... Uh, the, explain the motivations of their villains is because there's something scary about the unknown that goes on inside someone's mind. There's something genuinely terrifying about the idea that the person you are sat opposite having coffee with or whatever could have thoughts where they reach across and tear your throat out or whatever it is. Like that's for some spurious reason that they've justified over and over again in their head. That's terrifying. The idea that someone's like, what they did, what they did was they made, like, die hard at a concerto, meaning that the big twist is, oh, by the way, we're just common thieves, which is the twist of die hard, <laughs> where you think it's terrorism, but really they're just trying to rob a bank. Bomb. But it works in that case, because there's like a whole bunch going on, and a whole bunch at stake, and blah, 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 blah. You can't suddenly, in the middle of your, like, psychological Hitchcockian thriller, go, well, by the way, it's all for a big sack of money in a vault somewhere. But it works in Die Hard, because their plan requires people to think that they're terrorists. Right. So the fact that the audience are with that, too, that works. Yeah, I mean, I... Um... In here... I suppose they're meant to set it up like we're meant to believe that this guy is just a... A crazy music nut. Either a crazy music nut or someone related to the family. But, you know what? You know what the but really, he's just trying to get the magical key to open the magical box to the magical land of lots of money. Right? <laughs> That's true. You know what? You know what? You know no. what the other problem was? The other problem was that at no point was Elijah Wood's ability to play the piece ever in doubt. Like he, just, what I'm he played everything perfectly all the time, even when there's a girl in another restaurant. But I said that earlier as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the you're whole right. that was point that about was, that him having really stage fright seemed to be utterly negated by the fact that he could still play through while a guy was like, not only that, but play through while a guy dragged the dead body of his friend or boyfriend of his sister's wife or whatever. I don't know what it was. Also, why did they choose that first concerto, given that he plays for about seven seconds of a 20-minute piece, as well as I can tell? Unless Q's like picking them. I'm going to need plenty of time to talk to them. So I'd better put that on the fucking program. I have no idea. I've, I've, I've absolutely no and idea. See, again, that would, all you need is, is, a, is a script doctor on this. Because you'd fix that by going, all right, he's not a, the fucking locksmith. Jesus. But if he is a family member trying to get his hands in the fortune and discovers that that's what happens, yeah, we're all done. Yeah, we're all done. Yeah. Like, which, which works. Like, a family member could know that there's a lock and the piece and all that nonsense, right? And the family member could also be you know, wealthy enough that he's running Anthony Michael Hall, right? He's running Anthony Michael Hall, but he's got shitloads of debt, right? And his father didn't leave him anything. He would know that, right? He would be able to pick the pieces. He would be able to organise the piano coming in, right? And cues that could be like, could even be like a sniper that's worked for him. There's a whole level of things you could, and that's easy, done. It's a page's worth of writing. You add to that script, and all of a sudden, a whole section of it now makes sense. Do you know what I mean? Just by doing that. It makes slightly more sense. You, you have a family member running Anthony Michael Hall, right? And you have her and him split up. I love that there's a place... 28% better. Yeah, there's that. Yeah. And it's a five-minute meeting at a table with, yeah. a, with a bio and a blank piece of paper. Yeah. And you've got a better, you've got a better move. Yeah. Yeah. Also... You're this rich, famous, bonkers composer and you want to, like, lock a key in your piano, right? Right. Right. And you hire a locksmith to do that. Yes. Do you tell the locksmith how much money <laughs> and where the vault is and what this key opens? You're right. Again, it's, beca it's because... You don't, do you? It's, fa it's far more, again, it's to do with, and I'm sure they're very nice and lovely people, but they were strokey, strokey beard, ho, 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 aren't we being clever with us? It was too... Any time any problem like that came up, they have so little... You see it a lot in um, science fiction as well, when when serious strokey beard people either write or make science fiction. They have so little regard for it that they think that um, by fobbing it off with some nonsense... Um, 
oh, he was a lot better than that. It doesn't matter because all thrillers are stupid. Like, all of these films are stupid. So if it doesn't make any sense to me, that's fine. It's just a sense. Like, no, it's a... And it's science fiction as well. Like when clever, when the you know, clever streaky beard authors write science fiction. Oh, I can write this. I'm having a difficult moment with why this happens in my story. I'll just write them up in some stupid science fiction trope because it's all stupid. Who cares? You know, it's like no. Well, we care. Maybe you hate us and you prefer the straight beard to talk about the meaning of art, but we like space things and we like to be taken into that world and taken for a ride because our lives are a bit miserable, thanks, straight beard man. So at least give us that if you're going like, to also tie that to more oh, fucking existence, right? Yeah. But you can't do that and look down on the conventions of the movie that you're making. And every problem with this movie, every problem with this movie was to do with they had no regard for the conventions of the film they were making in my opinion they had regard for the way that it looked and they have a regard for being thrilled and they have a, they, they, they hold the fact that it's not going to make I, highbrow I don't even think movies. it's that complicated I think it was, that's not complicated so no, I, yeah, I don't even think it's that cynical although I appreciate your cynicism I think it's this entirely you can, you can write a script over a course of a year two years whatever that to you and to all the people you talk to about it they go oh it sounds great blah 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 blah. you can then cast it score it edit it put it all together blah 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 blah, and it can fail like the script can be something the cast can be something and the composer can be something that everyone agrees on and you can put it together and it can ultimately fail and then you can sit back and go okay why does it fail and actually it's only with hindsight that two people like you and me can go well it fails because of this bit right, 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 right. so I don't know necessarily that there's someone sitting around although there might be who's like well I don't give a fuck this will do I think it's far more that someone was like no 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 this is good this is like this is great I can put this together and blah 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 blah, blah. this happens here and it's all for this money and that's great right that's work that's this thing and then we can do it in a Hitchcock style it's far more believable that someone is ex- too excitable that they missed the glaring error in their movie than they realised the glaring error in their movie and then went ah oh, it doesn't matter I'm not saying I'm not saying that at all I'm listen I appreciate what you're saying and I'm sure you're almost certainly right and I and I think I think in terms of what you're I'm just saying with 12 production uh, no, no, companies no, 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 you no. don't get 12 production companies I know. excited about something that you think is throwaway no no no, I know but that's not that's not my point that's not my point I understand what you're saying I don't think that they are throwing away large parts of movie at all what I'm saying is in the process of creating a movie start to finish in the way that you're saying right you know you know what you know where your beginning is, uh, you know where your end is, and you know you know the journey that you want the character to take, right? And in the process of filming it, like you're saying, you have your scope, you have your cast, and whatever. And the reason that some of them don't work and some of them do is you have to make decisions while you're filming. Uh, sometimes because, you know, someone's dropped out or you couldn't get the thing. Like Hyams was saying about having to film in Chicago rather than New York, they're changing everything at the last minute. That would have changed things about the movie. The decisions you make along the way and some of them crop up because um, it's just something you haven't noticed before or how much how much attention are we going to give this which bit are we going to cut every movie is like half an hour longer than you end up seeing anyway so you make decisions along the way and I think you're right I think they're made with the best intentions but what I'm saying is I think in the creating of the story either before they start the film or during the film in the creating of the story problems come up how do we get from, it turns out we don't have a reason for, to get from A to B for the sake of argument, right? In this tiny little way that we need to come up with a reason for it, right? right. And instead of... Um, and then you, what you do is you have like, a couple of ideas and then you pick one and then you go. Right. My point is, is that I think in those moments right. they ascribe those problems to... It's not that they threw them away, but they gave them no, what they understood were generic conventional I, answers to them without understanding why, how that works or why and those I things would are agree, important. I would agree with you if it was a movie like Star Trek Into Darkness or Superman or whatever it is, one of those big budget movies which suffered from exactly the same problems. 
the problems with nothing to do with the CGI or the actors that they picked or whatever it was. It's to do with the fact that at scripting stage, no one went, <clears throat> this is bullshit. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I think on a big production you should be in every Star Trek meeting I think. yeah no I really should just because when someone goes oh, Wrath of Khan was successful how about we do that again I go uh, no <laughs> how about you come up with something that isn't a hasn't already been done very well right because the chances of repeating that yeah. are quite very small slim. right so but anyway that, that by the by what I'm saying is they believe when they make those movies that and I would agree with you that there is a producer somewhere that says, well, it doesn't matter because we've got Zack Snyder or we've got Superman or we've got massive CGI effects or, oh, we've thrown $300 million at it or whatever it is. I think that there is a, a lot of big budget movies suffer from the problem you're talking about because people believe that people go to those movies just to see the big effects and no one's really following, no one's really following the story because look, Look, Superman, right? Look, Superman's oh, I understand what you're or, 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 Look, Captain Kirk, or whatever I, compl- I completely agree with you. However, I think on a little independent movie like this, with all the producers that it has, but I'm I think it's sold on the strength of the script. No, no, I agree with this. Don't get me wrong. I completely agree with you. And, I, and yes, what I'm saying can be applied to this. And that is a problem. Agree. But I'm saying specifically with this film, because they are making a self-consciously silly beamer, I don't think they are. I think they were trying to make a Hitchcockian romantic I think, No, thrill. I think that, yes, I agree. But I think the director's interested because of what he could do visually. I'm saying, I think they knew it was a bonkers script. I think phone booth, they thought, yeah, this is a, a silly beat, but it's fun and it's entertaining. And I think they were trying to do that, but it was... I'm saying, I think, that because it was an indie serious companies, indie serious people at some point involved making a silly beam that they thought that they could by setting the B movie, the silly B movie, in a world traditionally associated with high art, piano concertos, concerts, whatever, that they would be allowed to um, use the conventions of the city movie to move along a story that had even only small but in their mind probably significant reflections of the weight of the high art in which the world was taken i.e. that they could bring weight to the to the silly conventions and my problem with it was that there were significant plot points and moments in the film where they felt this doesn't need our weight this is moving the story along and that's enough and they didn't think or care to figure out a way of putting their movie together so that it hung together better than it did I think they felt that the impressions of it, the look of it the feel of it were enough to get across the point that they were making which I think had something to do with um, the creation of art and um, what it means to be an artistic performer and uh, to labour under the expectations of an audience and I mean I think it the point to me if I had to say the reason that we've got high minded people involved was something to do with audience and performer and the expectations of an audience and expectations of the performer and the relationship between the two and yeah, Cusack was in their mind I think supposed to be the epitome of an unfriendly hostile audience I think yeah. anyway I think it was speed on a grand piano and I think there is a way to make speed on a grand piano I, th- I think the reason why it's set at a piano concerto is I think whoever was wrote it or made it or whatever went along to one and realised that most classical pieces have a tension and drama to them they have crescendos, they have rises they have falls, they have whatever and it's the reason why film scores have the same thing is because it's all about the creation of tension and I think that the seed of the idea comes from Well, what would be more tense than someone playing this who had choked five years previously, 
someone playing this at gunpoint someone like and I think they threw everything at the kitchen sink at this idea of music being something that drives tension and I think they're the seeds of the idea agreed agreed agreed. now I think there's a the problem with the movie to look at it from another way if you take it as speed on a grand piano right or Die Hard 3 on a grand piano or whatever like which would have been so much better right not Die Hard 3 Die Hard 4 on a grand piano no, Die Hard 3 with Simon like running him a merry dance while right I'm sorry right I just meant I wish they'd made Die Hard on a grand piano as the fourth film right as the fourth film no I think that the um, the problem with the film therefore if that's your script if, you're, if, you, let, if I take the premise like you're taking the premise oh we have this silly thriller I think the problem there is it's a silly thriller script given way too much emphasis, way all the stuff you were talking about by an artistic and uh, creative director. Whereas had it been a bit more... The only way to make Die Hard on a Grand Piano or Speed on a Grand Piano would, would be to blow everything up. I mean, physically blow everything up, although that would have helped too. To blow everything up to melodramatic proportions to make everything which is what Argento is great at right. he makes everything operatic literally he did a movie called Opera like he makes everything incredibly weighty and incredibly over the top and incredibly weird and whatever like and you either do that movie like this or you write a better script and make a Hitchcockian thriller the problem with it is it was neither one nor the other yeah no okay I know I think you're right the, the only thing I was trying to get at although um, and, I, and I accept that I, how I see it is is exaggerated and, and almost certainly not fair on the people involved because I think that one of the things I did like about it was that I think they were enjoying themselves and I don't think they were looking down and I wouldn't and I don't think that's fair of me to say at all I think all I was trying to point out was I think there were moments probably in the filming of it that the things that were exciting them were not the uh, was not the was not the telling of the story, but rather the things they could no. do with the story. Which is fine, because that's, Almost that's how it works. But I think that's because they got this, all these people got the script initially, and was like, oh, we love the script. And I think they gave no more thought to it. Yeah, I think that's right. exactly what it came yeah, down to. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. you're right that when they got into making it, they were looking at the visuals, they were looking at the dailies, they were looking at the performances and thinking, oh my God, we've got a hit here. This looks incredible. Look at the red against the black silhouette and the whole bit. And look at the way that the piano playing matches up with the thing. Like, I'm, I'm sure. Because it was all done really expertly and professionally yeah, yeah, well. Yeah. But, and but, I'm sure they had... But maybe their problem, maybe their problem is the same problem that we're having in the... In terms of like applying what I'm saying out of the water or making it irrelevant, is that the central premise is so stupid. stupid. You can't muck about with it too much because if you look at it too much, if you look at it anything except out of the corner of your eye, then you're doomed and you might as well just give up. Yeah. So I think, yeah, you're probably right. But at the same, at the same time, I don't think we're just sat here going. I hope we're not just sat. My whole point is that the script and the twist and everything that was included in the movie, because of everything we've spoken about, the characters and and the setting, was unsatisfying. Yes, agreed. I think that I'm not sat here, and I want to make this clear, saying just because the twist was silly and I could poke holes in it, I detached myself from the movie. That's not the case. No, we both enjoy plenty of songs of Aspen. Right. I am poking holes in it with hindsight. I wasn't sad in the theatre while going, well, he could just smash the piano with an axe. Like, I went along with the, the theory, but my main problem was when at the very end, Elijah Wood fucking up and not giving him the key had absolutely no consequence other than he got a little bit angry. That made it an unsatisfying conclusion because you were like... So what did I just sit through then? If there's no... Right. Yeah. Had, had Cusack, for example, 
shot the woman at the end of the movie when he played the thing wrong and stormed the theatre and got, I don't know, arrested, brought down, for whatever it was. And had there been a bit confusing chaos, like everyone runs for the exit, big exciting ending, with... Elijah Wood's wife's blood dripping away. Let's say he doesn't shoot her in the head. Let's say he shoot, catches her in the shoulder and she's uh, whatever. That would have been a satisfying, you don't have to worry about the plot twist guy's conclusion. Yeah, to the movie. agreed, agreed. But the whole problem is... is there's a, the, yeah, there's a way of looking back on it and, it, and almost enjoying all those things. In is that the last scene in the movie, he goes into the truck which is in probably picking up a broken piano anyway, which makes... Really quickly. No sense. Like, they're still sitting in the ambulance. Right. Having been tended to. And, the, you know, the police are still knocking around. The piano's and they're, they're, already they're, in They've the already truck. loaded the piano into a truck. The, the rain starts, which is meant to be like some big, you know, dramatic, creative, artistic thing. Like this gothic... But again, it was a good... But it was a good joke. I liked him playing... The last four bars of Breaking Panic, and it's sounding the way that it did. Right. It was a good joke. It was. But it had no weight, right? It had no consequences. But it wasn't satisfying. Yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Like... It was, yes, that's the conclusion, isn't it? The conclusion is it wasn't satisfying. Right. And anything else we're saying is like we're trying to write it, and that's maybe why we sat down and talked the way that we did. We've been trying to figure out why it wasn't. Satisfied. That's why we wanted to sit down and talk about it, was because we left the, the theatre unsatisfied, but we weren't quite sure why. Right. Because so much of it was in place to be satisfied. Right. And that's what I'm saying. Had the theatre at the end, had Anthony Michael Hall at the end exploded. Right. Or whatever. Had he shot the woman, there'd been a scream, a bunch of people charged out of the theatre, Cusack ran down onto the stage with a rifle being mental, like, play the notes, play the notes. Like, that at least would have been... The whole reason why action movies end with a massive climax is it's the way, like, magicians do. For, for 85 minutes of the movie, they're going, look over here, look over here, look over here, right? And the last five minutes, they go, blow a lot of shit up, and then they won't realise that what they were looking at for 85 minutes was, you know, rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's like the whole thing with Indiana Jones. It's you have the big dramatic ending where everyone's face melts off, and the hope that no one goes home and goes, "What if their face was going to melt off? Why did everyone <laughs> like? Why did we just watch ninety minutes of someone trying to get the ark away from them if the ark is going to destroy the, the the soldiers of evil anyway? Why don't we just let it do its job and we'll all stay home? You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. It's like almost every movie you could pick apart I'm not just picking apart this film because it's fun to pick apart movies I'm picking it apart because the very end scene left me unsatisfied and the very end scene asked me to buy into a premise which was never fully or satisfactorily exposed as being a decent premise anyway. can we get the check? sure thank you very much I wanted, to, I wanted to say can we get the check because I, I feel like you summed up Oh, yeah. the movie very well and I'm saying that the episode's over right, like that. right. That I don't really have I mean I, I don't really have anything to add to that because right. I think you're right I think one of the reasons why I was really thank you very much thank, thank you very much man. Uh, looking forward to getting out of the theatre sitting down and talking about it was I didn't know why um, I didn't I didn't know how to feel about it. Neither did I. Away. That's what I'm saying. I didn't watch the movie going, oh, well, that's no, no, a plot no. hole. And right, right. Me, no, me neither. Me neither. In the, and that's why anything I've, uh, uh, anything I've said about the wife and they, sh they shouldn't have been together, these are the things that I've realised when I was talking about. But ultimately, you're wrong. You didn't have to seem satisfied. And that... That's, if you're going to make a silly beamer, the one thing you can't... It's OK to make a, a French drama about the unknowingness of man, the, you know, existence, and oh, isn't it complicated? You can leave the cinema feeling a satisfied wonder because oh, well, maybe that's what it was trying to do, you know? And, and maybe if it made you think one thing about life and yourself, then it probably accomplished its job, even if the media itself left you feeling a bit unsatisfied. But if it's a B-movie, start to finish, then it's supposed to take you with it and leave you feeling satisfied because that's what you paid your money for. I didn't pay my money to find out whatever the hell the movie was trying to tell me. Right. Because it didn't do it. Right. 
So you're right. But I, I think you summed it up really, really well. And I think you, I think your read of it and your take on it was a lot more honest and understanding than mine. Because no, I'm not I think, sure. I think it was a uh, someone wrote a fun little script based on probably sitting in the audience at a theatre. Yeah, I think you're right. And thought, what if bar, what if X, Y, and Z? Wrote that down. A lot of people who read scripts for a living read it and went, oh, this is interesting. It's kind of a bit like this, but with a piano or whatever. Uh, it is. They then got the director in front of people, and the director started talking about like thick, billowing red curtains and the silhouette and this and the camera. I could do. That. I could make lots of Hitchcock camera tricks with it. Right, and I think people could see the poster and could see Hitchcockian thriller succeeds on blah 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 as a tagline or whatever, and or as a byline from a, a critic, and and went great. Let's bankroll this and get it done. Who's available? Kusak. He's our very man. You know what I mean? Although they probably went to Cage first. Yeah. You see, I want to know... This was a question I wanted to pose to you, and one that I've been trying to think of a way to write a decent article for. Right. Nick Cage, right. because of a bad accountant, owed the government millions of dollars in back taxes and made some really bad investments due to this trusting the wrong person. Right? Mike Lennon Cup. Is the official story. Separate. And sold an incredibly like uh, expensive and almost priceless comic book collection to try and get out of debt. And then subsequently has been making like every script they hand to him just to scrape together a, a living so that he can you know, get back what he had succeeded in getting. Like, if you imagine you made The Rock but had no money to show for it, or you made Con Air and had no money to show for it, you must be like, fuck me, I had all this, I'm going to get it back. So he's just taking any script on the hope that it's the next Con Air or whatever. Not even on that hope, just on the idea of I've got to do as much as I can. Here's my question. Why is Kusak doing it? Because there was a point where Cusack was starring in relatively a minor A pictures, making money, and then making his own films. And he made High Fidelity, which was very successful. Gross Point Blank, which was very successful. Max, which was very successful. What? Max. He didn't, he didn't write it all. Produce. No, no, I think he produced Max. Right, but I don't think he... I think he knew that was going to be in a LARP picture. Right, fair enough, yeah. He then did War, Inc., which was a massive... I thought War, Inc. was, like... Massive. A long, I thought that was a long way past Gross Point Black. Oh, no, like it 10, is. 12 no, years No, no, it's after. the third script that he wrote. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm trying to say. I see. It's the third script he had a hand in writing with his two other writing partners. He did Gross Point Blank, huge success. High Fidelity, huge success. The third script he went to was War Inc. Because I think he saw himself as a... You know, he wanted to go the way of um, Tim Robbins, his good friend, where he could, like, star in the occasional thing, but then also finance his own more politically motivated comedies and or dramas. And since War Inc., which was made, by the way, for Peanuts in Bulgaria with a bunch of his friends and people he could rope into it because they too felt uh, shitty towards the Iraq war and what we were doing out there. So that's why Ben Kingsley's in it, Dan Aykroyd's in it, Mar Marissa Tomei's in it, and so on. Since then, he's only made movies that have gone straight to either video on demand, straight to Netflix, straight to DVD or whatever, the majority of which have been either in Bulgaria or Canada or whatever. Do you think he got over there and just went, I found my place, this is where I'm going to exist? I think, I think it's what? probably... It, I think Cusack suffers from Goldblum. Because remember when there was a point where you went, why have I seen Jeff Goldblum in any in years? Like, what's up with that? And I think it's because Hollywood needs its John Cusack with Jeff Goldblum. It's like... OK, we've got a big blockbuster picture here, and we need um, a serious 
respectable actor to be in it, but who has has already been in hit movies that people like, and um, has their own like quirkiness. Where we need that quirky character in the movie, like you know Goldblum in Jurassic Park and Cusack in uh, you know uh, And I think what happens is they do that. But there's only a certain number of times they can do that because Hollywood can't keep dropping them in those roles. Like there's well, Totoro and Oliver Platt have become right latter day versions because they're in Transformers and they're in right, right, right. So you drop and... you drop them in, but then you right. you can only do that. Um, like Totoro was that for a while, and then he didn't do it for ages. No, no, he's done it in all the Transformers movies. No, no, I know, but, but, but before the Transformers, it had been a while. That's what I'm saying. Like, there's a point where the quirky serious actor who's prepared to star in your block you can only use him once or twice now Totoro's in the Transformers thing but then he's in all the Transformers I guess I don't know I've only seen the first one um, and I think what happens to them after, after that they've got like a little bit of money and a little bit of a knack and so they can go off and they can do their own projects right Totoro has written and directed things Oliver Platt uh, well, Oliver Platt's fine um, because Oliver Platt will do TV, right? That's why Oliver Platt's okay because he'll do the West Wing or whatever, and he'll turn up in. You know, and he's like a big fat, man, and everybody needs a big fat. Man. You know, you're never short of how many a big fat. Man. Um, but if you won't do TV, right? Like Goldblum tried it and did it for a while, and presumably does some theatre as well. Because he's mainly picking thrillers. Yeah. He's not. He's not really doing action movies. He's not really doing comedies. He's mainly doing thrillers. Right. The Number Station. He had that other one that came out, um, which I also watched. Um. He did the Paperboy, which was like. Oh yeah. Him doing a, a conscious. Oh, he wasn't he in art film. No, but no, 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 because it was that guy, um, Lee Daniels. Because wasn't he in the White House one too? Wasn't he in the Butler? The butler yeah, yeah. Wasn't yeah, he yeah. one of the presidents? Yeah, he was. Yeah. But that again is him showing up to do like a character turn in something. It's just at a certain point he clearly lost his sense of humor. What else did he do apart from the number station? There was something where he was a detective. Yeah, he was a cop. It was awful with the woman out of. Um, it was a serial killer film, right? Yeah, it was terrible. I couldn't watch more than 20 minutes of it. It was so bad. <laughs> That's on Netflix, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I was kind of hoping that might be quite good, but it was so bland and generic. It was unbelievable. Yeah. But I, think I had somebody the... mad as a killer. I can't remember who it was, though. It was terrible. It's but just... I liked the number station. I thought the number station was good. I liked the number station. I know I just... you weren't such a big fan, but I liked it. I think there comes a point in an actor's life, like Cusack or Goldblum, whatever, where they're, where they're no Goblin's longer able. I think that's why Goblin doesn't do no, it. No, 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 no. There's, there's a point. Pacino went through it, and De Niro went through it. Actually, De Niro less so, but Pacino definitely. Where you're too old to be the leading man, but you're too young to be the character. Sea of Love was Pacino's first hit in like you know, 10 years or something. Like, and it was a comeback for him and he was old and a different actor you know, when he made Sea of Love as opposed to you know, The Godfather whatever Skyfall you know, he looks different he acts different and I think you either have to see, you have to see those years out somehow if you're going to end up being the kind of... I think he's waiting for his sea of love. I don't think he's... I think you're, I don't think he's got the face for it. I, I, he's always going to look, you know... A bit mid-30s, he's always the, going to look the, like the, that. the funny thing is, is when Cusack showed up at the end of Grand Piano and you actually saw him, like, people actually laughed. Like, it yeah. wasn't a... Well, he's, he's, he's a very... I don't think he... I don't think he quite understands what he's good at, either. I couldn't believe... In the, the number station was all right because he could just about get away with that. But the serial killer one, I think he thinks that he can inhabit these roles, but he can't. His problem is very similar to Jeff Goldblum. It doesn't matter what you put him. He's always going to be John Keyes. He's always going to be Jeff Goldblum. He can't. When George Booney's in a movie, I buy him as that guy. Even though I understand that it's Clooney, I buy. But everything I see Keyes, I never forget. Or Goldblum. For a minute that I'm watching Jeff Goldblum acting. So you can't pretend to be a, a troubled cop, Cusack, because you're, you're not. You're John. Now, like, if you're having fun being the character, 
in that you know, gross point blank, whatever. That's fine. Because he must go into his wardrobe or his trailer and go, what am I wearing this time? Uh, it's a black suit, Mr. Yeah. Kisak, yeah. with a black shirt and a black tie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot of black. Yeah, a lot of black. Yeah, that was but, you know, but that, seriously, every movie, doesn't matter what he's playing, he wears black. It's like, for a while, after High Fidelity came out, Every movie, wherever he was in, he wore a Ramones T-shirt just to go and Cusack around and wearing Ramones. Right, right, right. There was, I'm not even kidding, have you ever seen, and it's a terrible rom-com, and we'll end it with this comment, but have you ever seen... The one with Kate Beckinsale? Must, no, no, have you ever seen... Uh, must, no, Serendipity. Serendipity. Th- that was actually okay. But um, your, your whole fucking scale of what is okay at romantic comedy is so off, right? Because you've seen every utterly appalling, soulless piece of crap romantic comedy ever. And there are ones amongst the canon of soulless, utterly awful pieces of shit romantic comedy that are less soulless and awful pieces of shit. You go, actually, it wasn't so bad. But only when compared to a Catherine Heigl movie. But you tried to persuade me once. And, and here's the thing. You still believe this to be true. You don't see for a minute that Two Weeks Notice is one of the worst pieces of shit. And the script is so bad. Everything about it is so awful. But you've looked me in the eye and believed it when you said, actually, it's not too bad. The it script is bad. quite good. It's not. It's not. <laughs> it's just compared to it the other a, or, no, no, it has you were an made, Audrey Hepburn You were made quality. to sit... No, it, has it, Audrey, it does. No, it it does. Sandra Bullock is amazing. No, no, films. I'm not... I'm not no, no, I'm, we're not talking about that. Talk to me about the, the one you were talking about, the romantic comedy, John Cusack. He, Bob. I'm not kidding. He was in a movie called Must Love Dogs, right? <laughs> that With was Diane Lane. Diane Lane, that's right? right. And it was the most bonkers movie I've ever seen because on what... First of all, the movie had nothing to do with dogs at all, right? But what was even more bonkers is Cusack had clearly said, I'll be in your rom-com, right? But only if... I can wear black? No, no, but only if I can basically be Cusack. So he lived in, like, a shed above a, a barn where he made handmade boats that nobody like bought and, like these incredibly like these row boats but but they were made like handmade specifically they were they were like works of art and whatever and he like spent out like independently wealthy one presumes no no explanation as to what he sculpted around wearing a Ramones t-shirt and a long black coat a lot like he had lots of quotations by fucking Kierkegaard and Proust and stuff like that and he was just like but, but this is just the guy that Diane Lane has got to end up with at the end of the movie, right? Diane Lane doesn't give a shit about any of it. Like, <laughs> why is it? Like, the movie's called Must Love Dogs. Yeah. Why are you skulking around a Ramones t-shirt, <laughs> planing and sanding boats? Like, what has that got to do with it? <laughs> but Chris said, clearly when I'm a deep thinker, I, like, th- I think this is what he thinks about himself. I'm a deep thinker, I'm an intellectual actor, and my characters have to have some aspect of intellectualism to them because it had worked in gross point blank it had worked in serendipity which I know you don't agree with but it does like that's the character he plays in serendipity um, good luck getting me to watch a romantic comedy I don't want Kate to watch it. I don't you know what I mean uh, it's 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 just odd that he hasn't done that like since Muscle Dogs he hasn't done that role since and he might try and imbue these other roles that he has with like some level of intelligence or some le- level of detachment because detachment kind of is something Cusack does a lot as well like I'm in the drama but really I'm thinking about some French poetry I read this morning <laughs> over a latte <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> What's on is that he hasn't, like, he hasn't put Jeremy Piven in a movie. <laughs> for eight. And he did that a lot. He put Piven in a lot of movies, right? You think Piven takes his phone calls now? Like, I, Mr. Piven, I have a reverse charge call from Bulgaria. <laughs> Will you accept the charges? No, thanks. I'm an entourage. I don't need that anymore. Well, he's not an entourage anymore. No, he's not. What has Piven done since entourage? Nothing. Probably begs to get the entourage movie made. Which they're making. But Piven used to be a really funny, like, best friend kind of actor. Yeah, I yeah, like yeah. Him. yeah, me too. And he's in Serendipity, and so the scenes with him and Cusack in it, although I wouldn't suggest you watch it, I'm not, so I'm saying that the scenes with him and Cusack in it, while not as funny, are as watchable and, and pretty good in the same way, I agree. in the same way that Bruno Kirby and Billy Crystal and When Harry Met Sally. A glass full 
of, of scummy, disgusting water in the middle of a desert of shit is a glass of water. And Piven and Cusack would be drunk down, do you know what I mean, in yeah. the middle of this awfulness yeah. with the gusto of a man desperately in need of anything approaching entertainment. Yeah. But set next to other <laughs> things that are actually entertaining, it's a glass full of scummy water. That's all I'm saying. OK, fair enough. Fair enough. But I agree with you about I mean, I agree with you about Cusack. It's like, for ages, I was so puzzled. Because like, I was a... Like, putting Jeff Goldblum in your movie will only make your movie better. Like, there's no way that Goldblum makes your movie worse. Uh, except Morning Glory. But was that a bad movie to begin yes. with? And he failed to rescue it. He failed to rescue it because he'd been incorrectly given a serious role. Oh, well, there we go. Well, there you go. My point is, you make any movie, yes. right? You're Roland Emmerich or whatever. Right, right, right. Right, and you go, I'm making a stupid film. 2012. That was the last big blockbuster Cusack yes. did. Yeah. Cusack did 2012. Yes, he, did. he was good in that. I quite like that. I like 2012. I like 2012. I like all Emmerich movies. Because They're all brilliant. occasionally, a Platt or a Cusack or a Harold yes. well, he will show up. He understands. Yeah. If I'm going to make a and shit... And well, Edgefall was in that as well. Fucking hell, he was, wasn't he? In fact, Emmerich's movies, are up until the Tatum Channing one that just came out, the, the White House down... It's a bit too self-conscious, I think. No, no, but they all... Like, had the president in, in White House Down been played by... I don't know, Peter Weller or someone, right? And had... I'm the, listening. Had the <laughs> Tanning Chatham role been played by... Who's a... I don't know. Who's an interesting Emmerich-style... Dennis Quaid. Quaid. Troubled former Secret Service agent. Phone call to Dennis Quaid. Right. Clearly, we've got, to have, we've got to have some Quaid. You can't. Can you repeat? Can it be? A, can it be a two-card Quaid trick? Yeah, of course. Is that possible? Are you kidding? I watched Legion recently, where Quaid's diner in the middle of the desert gets beset by a. Yes, I'd like to see that. And Quaid is re- like He's Quaid saves really him from the movie. I think he does. Because yeah, because I mean, look, Bentley was okay. It was like the. I like Bentley. No, no, Bentley was Bentley absolutely doesn't get enough work. Fun. Bentley was absolutely fine, and I watched. But it. Bentley needs to get dropped into bollocks. Like there's some actors. Oh, had Bentley been the right? See, look, look. Bethany and Cusack, whatever, these people, if they're allowed to do the things that they want to do, it's a biography of Darwin, don't, shut up Bethany, <laughs> shut up Bethany, and be my man. Was he in know. a biography of yeah, Darwin? Yeah, he was in a biography of Darwin. It's like a picture of him and a monkey. And he's going, oh, this monkey means something to me, but what could it be? Watch the movie to find out, kids. You know, yeah. Darwin, no. <laughs> 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 but he shouldn't be allowed to make those films. He should be dropped into bollocks because he's like, I have a shitload of integrity, a whole bunch of screen magnetism I don't even know what to do with, like Goldman and Cusack have. So put me in a load of nonsense right. so that I make the nonsense more believable. Like 2012, you know, except whenever he's the, he's the serious bad guy. Yeah. If Bethany had been running around with the crazy hair solving the clues, that would have been a lot better. Than yeah, it would, yeah. But yeah, Hanks yeah. is like, yeah. is it true that my face is getting more like a potato? <laughs> Could we make my hair longer at the back and then maybe it'll look a bit less like a potato? I don't know. No, I, now you just look like a hairy potato. I think, I think we, we could probably re, 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 um, recast White House down in a far more... In, I, I I wonder if that wasn't ended up like that because the they why, found out that the other one was being made and they knew that theirs was going to be finished later. So maybe they like recast and redid something to try and make it like... Because who you like to be a bit And I'm not a butler. Because it, it, was, it, was it goes against the run of how he normally casts his movies. That's what it I mean. seems to me. You know, he normally casts. Because I'm his not lead interested as a in Jamie Foxx being the president. Right, but Dennis Quaid. In... Look, look at the leads of his other Dennis movies. Dennis Quaid as the president. Bill Pullman and Jeff Goldblum in Independence. And this is Will Smith, this is Will Smith before he became a superstar. Too. Right, right, right. You know, like interesting, weird, quirky people. But Jeff Goldblum, John Cusack, Dennis Quaid. You know, Woody like, Harrelson in 2012. Oh yeah, Oliver cool. Platt. Yeah, yeah. You can't. Oh. Even Gyllenhaal manages to carry off a Spader. day after tomorrow. I need 
Spader as a scientist, you know, in Stargate. What the hell are you doing? Who are we going to get? A, let's cast the sleaziest Spader. man in the yes. world as a scientist. As a scientist. And who gets away? And Russell. Kurt Russell and James Spader. That is an amazing these are excellent cast. combination. Yeah, they are. Pullman and. and um, uh, Goldblum. Oh, Goldblum and Smith, rather. Quaid and even Gyllenhaal is good in. But it's Spider like it's. A, well, it's Quaid and Ian Holm at the beginning. Oh, which yeah. always oh really Quaid and Holm should have definitely taken down Global Warming. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think the killing of home is the biggest up. mistake. Yeah. With they that fucked bit. up global warming. Yeah, about yeah, home yeah, and yeah, Quaid. yeah, yeah. Because you could have had a whole like double act where Quaid kept wanting to give home like bigger guns, and home was like, yeah. I don't know what to do with this. Yeah. It would have been great. It would have been terrific. But yeah. I wonder whether that wasn't recast when they knew it was going to get finished in time. Because they do that thing where like they're going to rush the other one out, and the only way you can hope to do better. You're like, talking about why I was done. Yeah, because like Robin Hood, they rushed another one through before Costas went. Uh, the one with Patrick Berg. But I really and like, that, although I'm not a fan of Eckhart. Because everyone knew there was another one. Sorry. I'm not a fan of Eckhart, I'm not a fan of Buck. I really like the Olympus Has Fallen movie. Well, that's fine, you're, you're allowed to like that. But, but only because it was so Butler taken right, away yeah. from his, like, I'm going to be. Because. Butler is horrible in everything he's in unless he's playing some mad like gun-toting shouty guy who isn't meant to be being taken seriously but I, but I yeah plus they never asked a car to like strap down to a vest and run around with but a I gun. think that I, I, would, I wouldn't White have House been surprised I wouldn't have been surprised if the, the only way to the only way to make if you you're, you're making your two White House films right? you know that your audience is going to go and see both this is not going to happen the only way you can persuade them not to go and see the first one and to hold out for the second one is if they know the second one's going to be much better that's why they're held out so if they know that hey these two big stars are going to be in there and it's by the guys of Independence Day whatever we'll hold out for that rather than from the director of Training Day starring Gerard Butler they must have thought there's no way he was going to go see that but it was quite well put together and it had they managed to like you know had Morgan Freeman on his tea break or whatever right and so that people want to see you know what I really liked about it they didn't they didn't make Morgan Freeman the president because everyone was like well Morgan Freeman's going to play the president right what they did was they made Aaron Eckhart the president but then they had the president taken out of play Morgan Freeman was a vice president and had to become the acting president it was like this wonderful way to like do a switcheroo you're right though Spader needs to be in a lot more things now that he's not doing TV well no he is he's doing the blacklist now isn't he which is inexplicably popular. No, it's terrible. I know, I watched the first it's episode. It was appalling. Unbelievably bad. None of this makes any sense. It's fucking stupid. It's the least there was one bit where he went to like a French restaurant and was very louche with everyone. And I was like... <laughs> I understand. Sounds like Spain is generating... What if, what if I went to a French restaurant? Drank coffee um, from a tiny little I cup. I think I'm going to go to a French restaurant <laughs> because I know where your wife lives. Yeah. <laughs> Spader probably gets so much of what he wants because he knows because he gets wife. to know like people's like, oh, this is your wife. <laughs> and they go. Mm. <laughs> and they, it would surprise me if he like licks inside their floor with a giant lizard tail. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how he gets Spader's more popping. French restaurants, I think. <laughs> I'm going to try. And also. I haven't seen the rest of the series, so I don't know. But it's meant to be that he's her dad, right? It's probably going to be like Lost, where they go, oh, everyone's already guessed the twist because people aren't as stupid as we thought they were. we better make it something else. It turns out that actually Spader killed her dad and then sent her to the moon. I don't know, whatever. But yeah. it, it'll be something like And like she's Lost, the worst person ever. We watched the first few episodes of Blacklist and I was, I was looking at the woman and I was like... She wearing a wig, and all that I could think of throughout <laughs> the whole show was like, "That's a wig, right? <laughs> wig, definitely. Maybe not a wig, but that's all I could think of." And then I was like, "Oh, him being loose in a French restaurant, wig. That's all I could think throughout the whole." No, and I'm I'm all for ridiculous premises sure. paying off in a TV show. I've got no problem with that at all. It should have been it's 24, just... but with James Spader as like one of the protagonists. Yeah, and it could have worked, but it's just like, no, it, the only way, the problem was, they were basically saying, the only way this works... Spader was like, wait a minute, I'm locked in this prison, how do I get out of this prison into a blue three-piece suit with a trilby hat and a hipster scarf, and how do I get around to get to sleep? Also, the biggest mistake he made, if you're trying to set it up that she's his daughter, which was like the running gag underneath the story for like the first thing he's got no one to sleaze over 
no one just leaves over a corpse. It can't take. You can't separate spider so and it's sleeve. From the sleeve. He will probably explode. Yeah. Right, yeah. So they will build up a sweat. Yeah. You know it was I mean? this weird thing where the, where the dialogue. <laughs> where, where the di- yeah. That's what's happened to the front of his head. Where the Listen dialogue was saying, I'm your father, but the actions were saying, I want to get you into bed. And it was this whole <laughs> weird thing. Because yeah. I was like, you're in a blue three piece suit, but you're meant to be an international terrorist. How does that work then? I don't know, but I have a, a succession of thin scarves I could wear. <laughs> <laughs> and coffee to be drunk out of very tiny cups. I look, look, I think we should stop because we could talk about this for um, ever and we should pay and get to Kmart so we can peruse some DVDs. Yeah, and where I can buy White House Down. Right. Which might happen. Okay. Well, I really enjoyed much that. For joining me again in the diner, Jim. Thank you very much for having me. I would never have seen Grand Piano on the big screen Could if it weren't for the after movie diner. Yeah, no. Yeah, oh, enjoy God. it. Love it. In the clouds above LA But Susan Sarandon no longer brings them biscuits And they've probably run out of things to say But I still say thank you to Martin Cusack He may be balmy and aloof But all the work you now do is Filling up my Netflix queue And I'd rather be watching
Like the show? Well, you can find our complete podcast archive over at amdpodcast.blogspot.com or aftermoviediner.com. You can send us an email at aftermoviediner at gmail.com, tweet us at aftermoviediner, or follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash aftermoviediner. Or why not be a part of the show and leave us a voicemail over at speakpipe.com forward slash aftermoviediner. You can also support the show a number of ways, by spreading the word to family, friends and co-workers, by writing us a review over at iTunes or TalkShoe, by purchasing some excellent diner merchandise over at cafepress.com forward slash aftermoviediner, by donating on our website, by advertising with our website, or maybe you're a regular Amazon user. If so, then before you make a purchase, go to amdpodcast.blogspot.com, aftermoviediner.blogspot.com, or aftermoviediner.com and click through the Amazon banner ads. It costs you nothing extra, but they throw us a few coins for the trouble. Or, like the movies we cover, then buy them over at our personal Amazon store, also on amdpodcast.blogspot.com. Really, thanks everybody for everything you continue to do, and please keep listening. There are men, and then there are second unit podcast men. The podcast you've just been listening to is part of the Second Unit Podcast Network. Find all of our shows at 2upn.blogspot.com or on Facebook under the Second Unit Podcast Network. Our fantastic list of shows include Drunk on VHS, We Came from the Basement, No Budget Nightmares, The After Movie Diner, Dr. Action and the Kick-Ass Kid, and Blood Baths and Boomsticks. Take one podcast into the shower. Don't be a blithering idiot, Alan. We can give you the multiple podcast cleansing system all in one place that your hair deserves. Our programming is available across all platforms from iTunes to Podomatic, TalkShoe to Stitcher, so you have absolutely no excuse. Listen today, and a free naked person of your choice will be shipped from Thailand to your door in a matter of weeks. The Second Unit Podcast Network, bringing you the action and leaving the boring stuff to the other guys. Bloody hell, who does a girl have to blow around here to get a decent beverage? <laughs>